What if you had a guide who could tell you how to bridge a gap between who you are today and who you're destined to be? What if each week you could hear a story of someone who has tried and succeeded, or perhaps tried and failed, but learned something in the process? Limitless Spirit is a weekly podcast where host Helen Todd interviews guests about topics and personal stories on defining life's purpose, pursuing personal growth, and developing a deeper faith in Christ. And God himself is relational as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But what I noticed in the book of Genesis is the way God asks questions and what it means to be in dialogue with God. And I noticed a pattern in the questions that God asks in Genesis. He only asks three questions in that encounter with Adam and Eve. And it's, where are you? Who told you you were naked? And what have you done? Now, what I love about those questions is they really relate to the deepest issues of the human heart. It is good to spend time with yourself occasionally, but living a lonely life actually puts you in danger. Through technology, we have more than ever ways to connect with people, yet loneliness is considered the epidemic of the 21st century. Whether you live far from your family and loved ones, or have recently gone through a divorce or a loss of a spouse, or perhaps you are surrounded by people but lack meaningful connections in your life, this feeling of loneliness becomes especially intense during holidays. Loneliness actually poses a serious danger not only to your emotional and mental health, but also to your physical health. Scientists identified that the negative impact loneliness has on your body equals that of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Welcome to this episode of the Limitless Spirit Podcast. I'm your host, Helen Todd. And my guest on this episode is Dr. Heather Holloman. Heather is an associate teaching professor at Penn State, a speaker, and an author who has become passionate about fighting the loneliness epidemic by inviting people to develop better conversation skills. Her most recent book, The Six Conversations, gives readers the insight on how to set the right goals for a conversation, how to ask the right questions, and other tools to help you make deeper connections with people around you. These skills will help you not only to make new and strengthen old friendships, but they're also extremely helpful in sharing Christ with people around you and influencing the culture. Hello, Heather. Welcome to the Limitless Spirit podcast. How are you today? I'm fine. I'm so excited to have this conversation. Thank you for having me on your podcast. I'm excited too. I also think um, that uh, being in the preparation for the Christmas season, the holiday season, uh, the topic that we're going to cover is particularly important. Um, and so I, um, I hope that it is going to be helpful to many of our listeners. So um, your book, uh, your latest book, because you have written a number of them, uh, is called The Six Conversations, Pathways to Connecting in an Age of Isolation and Incivility. And uh, I actually, last year, or maybe, maybe even two years ago, did a podcast on the subject of isolation and loneliness. And I remember doing a research on the subject and finding out that not only it's an epidemic, but also how harmful loneliness is uh, for people's health. I think um, the research showed that it equals the negative impact equals uh, to the impact of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So I'm sure you've done research on that. What have you found? Well, you're absolutely right that the effects of chronic loneliness raise your cortisol levels. They're even finding it's bad for cholesterol. It's really bad on the body because when you're lonely, your body's not working the way it needs to. It's it's stressful. Um, and again, I think they're mostly looking at cortisol levels and just what happens when you're lacking meaningful connections in your life. That's really what motivated me to write this book is the effect it's having on our health and the effect it's having on our mental health and our spiritual health to not have warm connections with other people. Well, and even from the spiritual perspective, we're not created to be alone. When God right. created Adam, uh, his first thought was, 
it's not good for him to be alone. So he created him a partner and a helpmate. And so we are communal creatures, if you will. So why do you think we're facing this epidemic of isolation and loneliness today when there are actually more bad, more ways to connect with each other than we ever have? Well, part of it is our conversations have changed into argument, outrage, people thinking that the point of connecting with others is to win arguments. That doesn't build unity or relational warmth. The other thing is the impact of social media. While I do believe, you know, I'm someone who enjoys social media, you know, I'm on TikTok, Instagram, all of those platforms. But oftentimes, it means that you're not having warm, authentic, in-person connections. And students even say to me all the time, you know, I text people, we share TikToks and memes, but we don't actually have meaningful conversation. And so part of it is that exchange of information. And, you know, something I care about on the college campus is people just have a lot of fear of speaking because of cancel culture. They're afraid um, of one another. They, they don't believe the best about each other. So they're always vetting one another. Like, okay, is this person safe? Who did they vote for? What did they believe about Roe v. Wade? What was their position on vaccines? So I see a lot of suspicion, judgment, fear, and then, of course, the reliance on social media. That, that creates a lot of isolation and loneliness, at least on the college campus, but also in my own life, in my neighborhood, and in my larger community. I feel that too. And that's a very good point uh, and kind of leads to my next question. So um, who is at risk for isolation and loneliness? Like in the past, I think um, uh, it was uh, the research stated that um, elderly people Mm -hmm. are more at risk or maybe a person who lost employment is more at risk. But today, I don't think this problem is limited just to those groups of people. So uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, one thing I looked at was the Cigna Health study of 20,000 U.S. adults. So anyone in the adult population over the age of 18, and they're finding that nearly half the population is saying that they don't have meaningful in-person conversations. They're, you know, chronically alone. So really, it's not the elderly population anymore. It's really the adult population. And of course, Generation Z has been declared, you know, the loneliest generation, the people studying um, and doing surveys on that population. So I really think, you know, everyone's at risk. I mean, people, even who I look at in my classroom, who I feel like, oh, they must surely have lots of connections. They're extroverted. They're in a fraternity. Those are the same students that will say, you know, Dr. H, you have no idea how lonely I am as a college student. So I think everyone's at risk. It's time for what I'm calling a revival in this kind of commitment to new, fresh conversations and to go back to what a conversation is for. I have to ask, was there a particular incident in your personal life that prompted uh, you to write this book or you just uh, identify the problem that we're facing in society? Well, you know the way God works, Helen. I really feel like this is something I've cared about ever since I was a little girl as a military daughter, you know, moving around a lot. And as I moved into adulthood and in my professional life, I've always cared deeply about connecting people in loving community and reading research about belonging because I felt so disconnected and lonely in my own life. But really the event that precipitated this book was two things. The first was my husband and I had written an award-winning book on evangelism that a lot of people were reading. It was called Scent. And what we found as we were doing workshops and speaking is people love talking about their faith, but they had a problem beginning a conversation in general. They didn't know, okay, how do I ask even the first question? Then what's the next question? I'm stuck. I don't know how to have a conversation. So we, my husband really was the one who said, okay, well, we have to give people pathways so they can start and never get stuck in a conversation again. The second thing is I was sharing with my students the results of the Harvard grant study that was trying to answer the question, what's the single most determining factor of a happy life? And the results are warm, loving connection. So having a warm and loving connection is the most important prologue to a good life. So I looked at my students and they were like, okay, how do we get those? If that's the most important thing, how do we get those? So those two things really prompted this book, the research um, from the Harvard grant study, and then also my concern that 
people really have lost the art of conversation. And so how can we expect them to talk about Jesus, that, you know, the most important thing to them, if they can't have conversations in general? This is very true. And uh, I uh, discovered by experience that in my work, since um, we do missionary work all around the world, this is one common denominator between different cultures is Mm -hmm. that unless you take time to have a meaningful conversation about a person's life and, and you show your interest in their life, they really don't want to hear anything else you want to offer them. Um, I People are looking for meaningful connections and they're looking for someone who is genuinely concerned about their life. And um, I think that's the only way to share the gospel. You're absolutely right. With people in a way that is transforming, you know, for them. And for some people, it comes more naturally. I think I am a people person. <laughs> I think God knew exactly what he was doing when he put me in this path of work. And so I, um, I just love um, talking to people, but it doesn't always come natural to everyone. And uh, for some people, that type of conversation can be intimidating. And it seems like in your book, you have established some patterns that people can pursue to train themselves to be a good conversationalist and essentially to develop meaningful relationship with people around them. So let's talk about your findings. Uh, What would you think is the most important thing a person should know as they're pursuing um, becoming a good um, conversationalist? Well, the most important thing a person can do is begin with the right mindset, which is the disposition of their heart. So even if I gave you a list of great questions to ask people, you wouldn't have a warm and loving connection unless you have the right mindset. And what I discovered was in order to have a warm and loving connection, you really need four mindsets, meaning these four things have to happen in every conversation if you want that warm connection. If they're missing, one of them is missing, you're not going to have that connection. So the four mindsets are whenever you see someone and you're trying to connect, you want to, number one, be curious. Number two, believe the best about them, which many of us are not good at. Number three, you're going to express concern, meaning you're going to be invested in their lives. And number three, you're going to share your own life. So what I found was most people are deficient in one of those areas, which is accounting for their sense of disconnection and loneliness. In my own life, I've struggled with believing the best about people. I'm in a neighborhood where pretty much we're divided. Half of us voted for a different candidate. Half of us believe differently about social issues. You know, we're divided. And I thought, well, what if I stopped judging people and instead ask them about their lives and believe the best about why they believe what they believe. So that's really transformed my own relationships. Other people struggle with being curious. I talked to a professor who was having trouble connecting. He he did, you know, he knew I was doing the research for this book. And when I shared the mindsets, Helen, he was like, well, I know my problem. I just am not curious about people. I don't care about other people. Why would I ask about their lives? And I thought, well, okay, that's your problem. And so all the research shows the benefits of what's called interpersonal curiosity. People who are curious about one another have better mental health outcomes, their marriages are stronger, and you're just seeing so much joy and really positive effects in the brain when you learn to be curious about other people. So this is very, very cool. I immediately identified my weak points, as you uh, mentioned, these four mindsets. So we'll use me for an example just to help people identify. So I would say one of them is like uh, the same as you, is believing the best about people. And especially in our day and time, um, so I'm analyzing myself right now, why is um, you are, I, I feel like you're just opening yourself up to people being angry at you and, and despising you for who you are. Um, it's sort of a default mindset, like you said, with the cancel culture and uh, some of the topics being so inflamed. So that's one. And the other one, I think, would be sharing more about my life. And mm. that's for the mm. same. I feel like the reason is the same. You just make yourself vulnerable and open to just this angry response from other people. So how do we overcome those? I mean, because we're deficient for a reason in one of these four areas. So what are some practical ways to overcome? Well, I can move through all 
four of them and then tell you advice on in your own situation. So one of the things I teach people about curiosity, for example, is believing that the person you're talking to has infinite value. As created in the image of God, you have to see them as a marvelous creation, someone who can teach you something and reveal something to you about God that maybe you didn't know before and they can teach you something. So it's an it's humility. It's also living out Philippians 2, where you take on the interests of other people. How do you know what they are if you don't ask about them? The idea of believing the best, that is difficult. It's difficult when you know people have different positions. Maybe they're, they're living in a way that you believe is immoral. Well, what if instead of being in a place of judgment, you were able to think, okay, tell me the story of how you adopted that political position. Get curious about why they believe what they believe. And remember that the goal is a warm connection. The goal is not winning or an argument. We sort, I'm sort of passionate about teaching people to get out of the realm of public debate. Debate is great. I was a national debater. I want, you know, I was ranked nationally. I I know how to debate. I know how to win arguments, but that doesn't help warm and loving connections. So Thinking to yourself, my goal is not to change this person's mind. My goal is to love them, take on their interests, and even enact Romans 12, blessing those who persecute you, outdoing one another and showing honor. The expressing concern, that is where you're invested in people's lives. So if they share their major stressor, you express concern, ask questions about it, follow up later. It doesn't mean you, they violate your boundaries. It just means you know how to do that. Now, sharing your own life. To encourage you, Helen, what I've learned is when you have that warm and loving connection, you're outside of the realm of argument. So if someone asks you about your life and you share something that you normally are judged for, what happens in a warm and loving connection is you've really set the stage and help that your conversation partner be equally as curious about your position and want to know about your life. And so what you'll find is people move out of outrage. It's called the reactive brain state. And they move into what's called a receptive brain state because you've primed them. You believe the best. You are curious. You're expressing concern. Then when it's your turn to share your life, they're much less likely to criticize you or put you down. And if they do just continue to ask questions. You would say, you know what, it sounds like you're really passionate about this issue. It makes you really angry. I would love to know more about that. When did you first become so passionate about this? You know, go back to the curiosity to diffuse anger and outrage. And that's just advice for people who are afraid to share. The other thing I found is a lot of people aren't self-aware enough to know, you know, what are their major stressors? What decisions do they have to make? What, What do they want support? in in terms of their personal goals to be aware of those things so you can share them and allow other people to enter into your life. So these are all very good points. And um, I think uh, we're going to talk about you now as an example, because you teach at a public state university, Pennsylvania State University, which uh, would be... um, probably a difficult place to foster loving (laughs) conversations and relationships. So what have you noticed in the current climate of conversations like in in that particular environment between the students and professors as well, which I can't imagine being a Christian professor in a public state university is probably a challenge in itself. Well, that's why I love the research and the process of writing this book because it really changed my professional life, Helen. And what I found is people are not good listeners. And if you're a colleague that asks meaningful questions and then listens, you're going to have more social capital than you know what to do with. You're going to have more friends, more connections. I've been invited to participate in more projects, more fun things, all because I've positioned myself with the four mindsets And also listening. The number one thing I learned as I researched this book is what to listen for when you're talking to your colleagues, especially if if it's a hostile work environment. What I learned is you're listening for people's core values. And you're not judging those values. You're, You're trying to discover them and then you name them. And then you see how you can find common ground. So for example... There was an atheist colleague who knew I was a Christian. She was a very you know, public atheist, but we had to work together. We were going to work together on a project. And the first time I went to her office to introduce myself, 
I asked her, you know, a co- you know, we're going to talk about the six pathways, but one of them is cognitive. You know, what have you been thinking about? What are you, you know, what what have you been working on? What's going on in your mind? And she shared about some work projects that she was working on. But I noticed that every time she spoke, she would say things like, yeah, I turned that in and I wasn't able to do my best work. Or I did this project and I felt so bad about myself because I made this mistake. And Helen, as I was listening, I thought, okay, she values excellence. Everything she's saying relates to a perceived failure. So I said to this colleague, you know, as you're talking, I can tell how much you value excellence. And she said, oh my gosh, I do. I really do. So I moved down the six pathways to ask more meaningful questions like, well, what choices do you have when you know you have failed? That's a volitional question. And what's beautiful is when, so, when she would ask me, well, what about you? Well, you know, what do you do when you haven't done your best? It's actually a great opportunity to, pre- to present the gospel and how I deal with failure when I know that God accepts me and loves me no matter what. So after that conversation, she said to me, this conversation has been the best part of my week. Could you please come back next week? Helen, now we are best friends. We have lunch every Wednesday. And it was because I listened and she knows how to listen to me. And so even in like faculty meetings, if someone is speaking and I don't agree with them, I'm listening for core values. So I'm able to say, you know, as you're sharing that viewpoint, I really can sense that you care about efficiency. That's your most important value. I may not have that value, but I want to honor what this colleague is saying. You know what I mean? It's going to transform your professional life. And I have found even with neighbors, being able to listen and say, I can tell you really value this. I have so many warm connections with neighbors that I didn't even know last year because of putting in the principles of this book. I love this. This this is so important, not only um, to curing our personal issue with loneliness and lack of meaningful relationship, but also impacting people around us, impacting the culture around us. This is where it begins, you know. It's not with the projects and programs that we do, but that one-on-one um, ability to connect with a person, value them, even if they don't agree with you. If if every Christian pursued that, <laughs> we would be a lot more impactful than we are today. So you mentioned something in our in the previous question, uh, answering my previous question is that it's not the goal of our conversation. So you have, um, you outline three fresh goals for having a good, loving conversation. So what are those? Oh, Helen, this changed my life. So I thought that the point of conversation was to win. Do you know how bad that is for marriage and parenting and friendship if you're oh, always I trying do. to win arguments? I do. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, as a debater, you know, I'm an expert in rhetoric. I teach the art of persuasion. So what I learned from my research, which is all confirmed in the pages of the Bible, which was a delight for, for me, is that if you want to have a really warm and meaningful connection, you want your conversation to end in one of three places. You want to think about encouragement, helping people with their personal goals, or leading them to a state of marveling or awe or what the Bible would call worship. Now, these are really challenging. And if you do them, you're going to find so much success, not just in your relationships and in your marriage, but also like as a leader, as anyone who's engaging with people. So when I'm meeting with people and they're talking, I'm thinking to myself, can I say an encouraging word to this person? It might be a compliment. It may be something I notice about them. And then when we're in that environment of encouragement, you just start to feel that warm and loving connection. And you know, that's not just the social science research. I was deeply convicted by the passage of scripture that says, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up people according to their needs. Helen, I was not living that way. The second thing, helping people with their goals. In Hebrews, it talks about spurring one another on towards love and good deeds. And if you're mutually encouraging one another in your personal development goals, it makes for a really fun friendship. So I love it when my friends say, you know, Heather, how's that net, How's that project you're working on? Or what's your new book you're working on? Or how are your health goals? That's just fun to talk to friends like that. The last one is the hardest, but I love the research on awe. The research comes out of actually the elderly population, sending them out in nature with someone. It could be a stranger, but with the goal of experiencing awe or wonder. 
they found that their loneliness levels decreased, their anxiety decreased, their depression symptoms decreased when they allowed themselves to be in a state of awe. So I'm helping people and myself position their mind to think about what I call divine activity. So divine activity is if you notice something that other people may say as a coincidence, you can always say, that's really amazing. That doesn't seem like a coincidence. I, it feels like divine intervention. And even people who are not believers would say, yeah, it did actually feel supernatural. Or if I'm in nature, you know, I'm always pointing out, how is this actually marvelous? Like, this is mysterious. This is, we're so full of awe right now. It could be anything from snowflake photography to like noticing the phases of the moon, whatever it is. But I love noticing divine activity, talking about answers to prayer, rejoicing, gratitude. Those are all moving into the realm of worship. And, and what Jesus would say, or as we read the New Testament, sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. That's the kinds of conversation I want. Now, I wasn't that way. I was a complainer. I was self-focused. I was manipulative. I mean, I was the worst, Helen. I was the worst. So now I encourage, I help people grow, and I'm trying to lead us to a state of marvel. This is wonderful. Um, I love everything you've mentioned so far. So let's talk about the potential things that can go wrong in a conversation and how do we solve those? Well, I think a lot of things can go wrong in conversation, but the things that people would report bother them the most, I would say, is complaining and criticism, like divisive people. Because remember, the Holy Spirit's a spirit of unity. So if you're divisive, that's not something that pleases God, and it's not good for people. So I've changed from complaining to being someone who celebrates what's going well. The second thing people don't like is advice giving. It comes off as arrogant. It comes off as condescending. And I don't know, Helen, if you have people in your life where like you share something and immediately they're giving you advice. I stopped giving advice and I only give advice if people ask me or I'll say, would you like me to give you advice or do you want me to ask you more questions? They always say, I want more questions. You know, nobody wants advice unless they ask you. Um, Also things like, I don't know. I would say those are the top two in the book. I talk about, you know, 10 sort of pitfalls, but those would be the two that, you know, complaining and advice giving, um, you know, gossip's always bad. You know, scripture talks about ways to make your speech more loving. um, And, you know, not, you, you also don't want to manipulate people. You're not having conversations in order to get something from people. So those are kind of the things that I think go wrong. And of course, the not having the four mindsets would be the number one thing that goes wrong, I think. This is very practical, I feel like. And especially, you know, in this season when we get together with our families and friends to celebrate the holidays, I really um, hope that, uh, I I know that for me and hopefully for many of our uh, listeners, uh, there were some practical points that you mentioned that can make our holidays better (laughs) to start Mm -hmm. with. Okay, let's talk about these pathways, the yes. six pathways that you have discovered that lead to these conversations, good, loving conversations. Okay, this is so easy. Your listeners are going to think, why didn't I think about this before? So I've learned to think about the six dimensions of what it means to be human. So like if I'm looking at you, Helen, or talking to you, what's going through my mind is, okay, she's social. You have friends. You know, you're physical. You have a physical body, physical spaces emotional, cognitive, meaning you are thinking about things, volitional, that's the category about human volition, choices, and spiritual. So I can ask questions in any category of what it means to be human to start a conversation, and then I have endless permutations of where to go next. So for example, I may ask someone a volitional question. Hey, like I see them on the street and I say, hey, did you decide to buy tickets to the basketball game? And they say, yeah, I I did. I'm really excited. I'm going to the game. Now, a lot of people don't know where to go next in conversation, but I have six categories. I could ask a social question. Hey, who, who who are you going to the game with? Who do you like to take with you? And they may want to talk all about their friends. Or I could ask a physical question like, you know what? I love those games, but man, the bleachers are so hard on my knees. As I grow older, I'm just having the worst knee pain. What about you? They may want to talk about their bodies. A lot of people like to talk about pain. I could ask an emotional question like, hey, how have you been feeling about our team? 
you know, a cognitive question. How are you making sense of the decisions that the coaches are making? You know, you can go on and on. Now, the spiritual is a little harder, but you could say something that relates to divine activity, like, hey, those tickets were really hard to get. That seems like an answer to prayer. Or, hey, do you, are you like me? Do you find yourself, playing, you know, praying for the players? So I'm already in going down the pathways. And what I like to do is notice what people like to talk about. So if he want, if this person wanted to talk all about his friends, I would keep going down that pathway. But Or I would keep trying different categories. Young people, teenagers, they love to talk about their friends, their physical spaces. They don't love to talk about their emotions or how their spiritual life is going. My husband doesn't like those questions either. His favorite question is about physical processes, his spaces, projects, the snowblower he just bought, things like that. So figuring out what you like to talk about too. Like I love the cognitive category. I, if we were out to coffee, Helen, I'd love it if you said, okay, what have you been thinking about? You know, what have you been learning? So those are the six pathways. There are six ways to be curious about other people. It's so easy. You'll never get lost in conversation again. Well, there are so many questions um, I want to ask, but I think I and our listeners will just have to buy your book. <laughs> to find it's an out easy more. book to read, yes. <laughs> well, and it's very, very practical and, and um, very timely. But um, I want to ask one last question. So you end your book with the chapter called The Greatest Conversation About God's Questions in the Book of Genesis. So what have you discovered there uh, and why having conversations with God matters for how we relate to others? Yes, I love this question because of what you said at the very beginning of our interview, how God made us relational and God himself is relational as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But what I noticed in the book of Genesis is the way God asks questions and what it means to be in dialogue with God. And I noticed a pattern in the questions that God asks in Genesis. He only asks three questions in that encounter with Adam and Eve. And it's, where are you? Who told you you were naked? And what have you done? Now, what I love about those questions is they really relate to the deepest issues of the human heart. So for example, where are you? Is a question of, okay, where are you in relation to God? Where is he in your life? Where are you? Are you hiding from him? The second question is, who told you you were naked? I love this question because it's sort of like, who, is, who are you authorizing in the culture to tell you who you are? Who told you this about yourself? I love that. The third question, what have you done? It's this idea of reckoning, like coming to a holy God and saying, you know what? I'm a sinner in need of salvation. Rescue me, Jesus take the penalty of my sin. I want to receive you as my Lord and Savior. Those three questions I feel like are the deepest questions for the human heart. But I end the book talking about how God is a God of loving conversation. Once you kind of make sense of those questions with God, I talk about what it's like as a Christian to have a conversation with God each day and how he speaks to us through the Holy Spirit, through the Bible, through other people. And it's just one of the most beautiful things to have that sacred moment and then to move out into the world being an agent of blessing in the lives of people as you let God's love flow through you when you're having conversations. They can really become holy, sacred places. I love that. And um, um, oh, goodness, I, I'm having so many questions. <laughs> and we, can come back. Uh, we can have another one because I know it's a 30 minute what podcast. I'm thinking, Heather, <laughs> we're going to have to have another interview because I um I would love for us to uh, continue our conversation and talk maybe about some other books that you have written as well. But uh, um, concerning this particular interview, I'm going to post the link for our listeners um, to where they can purchase your book. But uh, if you want to mention your website. Well, yes. My website is heatherholloman.com. And as a special treat, if you go on the books tab and click on the six conversations, there are some free gifts for you. There's a free excerpt you can read, a free download of the first couple chapters. There's also a free worksheet on how to not get stuck in conversation. And then I also provide my list of 100 favorite questions that I love to ask my students or anyone to get to know them better. So all that's there for you. And of course, you can purchase the book there or at Amazon or wherever books are sold. Well, and you also have a blog, which probably they can gain access to uh, on your website. 
um, yes, and I, a podcast too. So yes, I'm not as faithful to my podcast right now. Again, I'm really trying to listen to God about where to invest um, time and resources. So occasionally I'll put a new post, you know, a new um, podcast out, but I do blog every single day a sort of a spiritual practice. And so you're welcome to sign up. I It'll come to your inbox every day. And usually it's something that God has taught me in scripture or just a moment that I like to reflect upon um, from the day. So that's all at heatherholloman.com. That sounds fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Heather, for this wonderful conversation. And you have a wonderful and merry blessed Christmas. Thank you. You too. This has been so fun. Heather brought us incredibly powerful and practical tools to make and keep friends. I would love to hear some feedback from you on how the six conversations helped you make deeper connections with those in your life. You can share uh, your testimonies with me through email podcast at rfwma.org. To learn more about Dr. Heather and to buy her book, you can find a link to her website in the show notes of this episode. At World Missions Alliance, we believe that change lives change lives. If you have a desire to grow closer to God and experience what it's like to be used by God for a greater purpose, or perhaps you have a deep compassion for the hurting people and want to share Christ with them, I encourage you to check our website, rfwma.org, and discover how you can get involved in short-term missionary work. Thank you for listening. Until next time, I'm Helen Todd, and very merry and blessed Christmas to you. Limitless Spirit Podcast is produced by World Missions Alliance. We believe that changed lives change lives. If you want to see your life transformed by Christ's love, Or if you want to help those who are hurting and hopeless and discover your greater purpose in serving Christ through short-term missionary work, check out our website, rfwma.org, and find out how to get involved.